is what matters in sense. What you write. That's really, really important to write about interesting topics. Characterize it well. Okay. Now, in my old days, I had in my office an entire set of jobs, John of Counting Research, uh, Counting's Review since 1940, because Carl Nelson sold me his collection. And when I needed something, I went leaf by leaf looking for it. And so the role of the A journal is now constructed in the mind of promotion lists. It's not about helping you with the topic of the research. It's about Swu uh, Fi Shengdu has a list of A journals. And this is ASNA, in my opinion. But I'm old guy, doesn't. Uh, I can't change this very much. I can change it a little bit at Rutgers, but nowhere else. Okay, and I can yell against it in the, in the American Accounting Association. But uh, if you wait for certain journals, you're not going to get published. The other thing is what matters is pipeline. How many rejections you get in development? Just keep them in the pipeline, keep submitting. And every time you get a rejection, you have the opportunity to prove the paper because reviewers read your paper. It's very difficult to get anyone to read your papers. Okay, your mom might read your paper, but she might not give you very good comments. Okay, and very difficult to, to get people to read papers. And when you send it, sometimes I, I send a paper in the accounting review that is not an accounting review paper, but is good enough not to get a desk to reject. And that moment, I spent $400, but I got some reasonable reviews. Sometimes you get idiotic reviews, too. Uh, and what that propitiates is to submit to the other journal or to some other place a uh, much better paper, because now I have to, some good readings. And that's what you really want. Okay? And just keep your pipeline full, and in a few years, you're going to have this moment that you get two or three acceptances in a row. And you also will have the moment that you have three or four rejections in there. You know, when I was at Columbia, um, they, any candidate that came in, uh, we were told to tell them, in order to stay at Columbia, you have to have one A publication every year. So Joe Burke, my colleague and me, created the accounting research data. And we went to the year of the start of JA, which was 63. And, uh, and picked up all the A journals and put the articles in there. And turned out, turned out that one person, Bill Beaver, had an A every year since he graduated from Chicago. And he was a full professor at Stanford. Okay. And even him missed a year. So I showed that to Columbia and they uh, okay. didn't help my tenure case, I tell you that much. Okay, but I was into systems at Columbia, no one was interested in systems. So was. But it's a different world today. There are not five journals, there are fifty. Okay? And you have to kind of keep submitting it, and you don't get it to one, try another one. The other thing is that if it doesn't get an A, go to a B or to a C, it's kind of reasonably good idea, but sometimes you don't get into a B and you get into an A. Another thing is, um, journals are a funny thing. A funny thing, and it's not a bad idea if you have doubt to correspond with the editor. And the other thing that is not that happens is that many of the large journals now have senior editors and editors. In my time, was editor and associate editor, but now they promote them everyone. Same thing, but they now have a different name. Okay, uh, and I don't like to be called senior editor because it makes me old. 
I'd rather be called edit. Okay, but um, but uh, you send something to accounting review, and it's a systems paper. We go to Lay Maldi, who is an edit, a social editor. Okay, so now they specialize a little bit these editors, and you can talk to them. You say, I have this paper on Bitcoin, uh, is this something you'd be interested in, and etc. They won't guarantee anything, but helps. And the other thing you can do is say, look, I am close to paying you, etc. I need, um, I need fast decision. That they will do. They will like it. They'll say, oh, I can't get a review, et cetera, but they will try their best, okay? They have a lot of sympathy for, for young scholars and that's their job, okay? But uh, there are a lot of journals out there. There are a lot of journals out there and, uh, you know, I always say there are several outcomes of a journal. There is reject, there is desk reject, you know what the desk reject is? They look at it and say, this can't get in, send it to the garbage. Uh, there is reject. After reviews, gets rejected. In accounting review, a large majority of papers that happens. Then there is revised to submit. Then there is light revised to sub submit. And there is accept subject to changes. And there is accept. I forgot the category. What is the category? I I forgot. Can't hear you. Final accept? No, 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 no. The category I forgot is do not, did not submit. That's the majority of articles. Articles, people sit on it. And it's not good enough, you're not good enough, and don't submit. If you don't submit, is there any chance of being accepted? You know. Yes or no? You will never know. Zero. Yeah, okay. Know. So submit. What's the hell? You get the rejection. And with the rejection, you get some reviews. And I say this to my young colleagues. I said, no, it's not about being rejected. It's about first you submit. Then we discuss. If you submit the accounting review, you have a 4% chance of having it accepted. If you don't submit, what is the chance of being accepted? Zero. Zero. Other interesting thing, Bayesian revision thing. If you submit to the accounting review, you have a four percentage chance of being accepted. But you just increase your probability of being accepted somewhere else. Because you got two reviews and you make the paper back. So what's the conclusion out of this? Well, the first conclusion is try to publish. Second conclusion is submit. Third conclusion is talk to the journals. And you are going to hear people say, focus on that A article and just do that. And then you go and ask the professor that advised you that is, what happened with two of the four last promotion cases here at Rutgers? They had one publication or zero. Then got promoted, not even close. Then got even reappointed in two cases. So what's the conclusion? Hmm? What's the conclusion? The conclusion is uh, they shouldn't be afraid of being rejected. They should always. Yeah, be rejected. Rejected, being rejected is much better than not submit. That's the conclusion. And you know, e journal is fine. Better than 90% of the people that don't have e journals. C journal is okay too. You know, you learn it. You start publishing, you start getting better at it. Okay, the other thing, knowledge is very wide these days, uh, interdisciplinary, although you should be an expert in narrow domain. Work with other people. Always work with other people. You should see Professor Helen, how many people she works with. Or me, we all work with a lot of people. And it's good. It's very good. A lot of people move to other universities where their colleagues are. 
So it's a very good networking mechanism. Very good networking mechanism. Um, okay, I want to talk about something else unpleasant. Okay. Um, it's very easy to go on the internet or go on an app, cut and paste. Okay, very easy. And we had in the last couple of years several episodes here of final exam cut and paste. And that's a problem. Um, every journal article to the AAA system goes through plagiarism detection. What is plagiarism detection? They have this huge database of published articles and they compare textual utilities. And then they give it an index of copy so 20% copy, 15% copy. Every single journal article goes by that. We got the paper accepted on the accounting review. Came back with a 17% fraud factor. I nearly died. And then we realized that my junior quarter had picked up a paper, a part of that paper submitted to a teaching conference to just get a free trip somewhere. And they proceeded to publish the three-page proceedings. And the things I had literally came out there. First, I nearly murdered her. Okay, I was furious. You don't do things like that. But second what was self, meaning just cite it and be okay. Uh, so, then the other side of the story, what's the value of Abby finds these two paragraphs that Bill Beaver wrote and rewording it so it's not plagiarism. Her English is not be, be going to be as good as edited Bill Beaver. So she just ruined what Bill Beaver wrote and uh, put it in her paper. So what do you do? Cite it. What's the big deal? There is no, you can't cite in a paper with too much cites. And I've never seen a referee come back and say, uh, you quoted too much. Sometimes referee come back and or the editor come back and say, too long the paper. Then you go and cut things off. And, and that's very common. A very good way to improve a paper is to shorten who have a tendency to repeat themselves a lot um, and have a tendency of blabbing on a lot in the beginning of the papers. Literature reviews are not a blab on exercise. Literature reviews are concise, place where you went in the literature and how you develop your topic. So very important, even in final exams, intermediate exams, don't copy out of the internet. And if you do it, Site. There is no cost to it. There is a big cost to not cite. Meaning, we, I'm sure the faculty here has been talking about expelling people that, uh, meaning, my theory is anyone that starts the PhD program here should finish. That's my theory. We had a visitor here from University of Michigan who was prior PhD student in Chicago. And so he told me the first day I went into the University of Chicago, the head of the PhD program was talking to us. And he said, look at the guy next door to me. So he looked at the guy next door to me. him and said, one of the two of you are not going to be here in two years. Okay. We don't have that philosophy. I, I think that if someone doesn't finish the PhD program, we make a selection mistake. That's my, my approach to life. And uh, certainly in AIS, we behave that way. We haven't lost too many students. Now and then we lose one, but most of the time, personal reasons. Okay. And so we are very positive about uh, 
if I had, the, when I joined the program here, we had some very bad admissions. Okay. Um, let me graduate. And I'm not going to say a name, obviously, because that's what I'm going to say now. But um, two years ago, someone shows up in my office, sits down, and says, Professor so and so told me that I should think about the doctor, and so and so was this person. And then I realized she is doing a great job in the university, educating a lot, teaching introductory, intermediate, that kind of thing. She's doing a good social mission. So I'm happy we graduated her. And I think that the university she is on is benefiting. So you know, there are people that are going to be real readers, there are people that are going to be literate, but if they educate, they are good. Also, when I was your age and I started my PhD and my professor's careers, I was very, very dogmatic about if you don't do research, you're useless and etc. Now we have colleagues here in the faculty that don't publish very much. And particularly one I'm thinking about, but he is fantastic. He does a lot of the things that I don't want to do. He's very teaching oriented, uh, and he does great things with our programs. So I have to be a little bit more reflective. And I don't know what's going to happen. This is, you know, my, in my 40 years of career, uh, education didn't change that much. The next 10 years, you know, the 200 colleges and universities went bankrupt last year. Why? Yes, that's part of the thing. Online education is changing the model. You know, yesterday I was at uh, our dean's house, and we had about 15 hour of senior faculty there talking about the future of education. And they had examples of different schools doing all kinds of interesting innovation things. And so there is a strong feeling on major universities that things are going to change. And what is the economic thing in business schools? Is the MBA program lost it, its lesson. If you are still Columbia, you still get 10 to 1 candidates and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But many schools with MBA program are having a lot of program problems filling up the position. And then the next thing is uh, cost of education is too high. And, uh, you know, I remember this was four or five years ago. I was paying $120,000 a year for my son's MBA at Columbia. Six years ago. So it's expensive. Very expensive. And it's not sustainable. You know, there is about $1.3 trillion in debt of education in the United States. How sustainable is this? Actually, some people think that the next explosion on credit is going to be there. I don't think so. But that's, uh, that. So the model is very difficult to sustain. Something is going to happen. And then the next part of this is, you know, I wrote a book uh, and an article called the electronization of business, and was about business converting to being digital business. And I predicted that brokerage, travel, and banking was going to become very electronic, and education. Those first three became very electronic. My prediction was good. Education hasn't changed that much. Why? I say it's easier to reorganize a cemetery than reorganize a university. Universities are very set in their status, tenure, and this and that. Piece. But now it's happening. And that's why the bankruptcies and etc. And you know, if you have to go and take an MBA program online, are you going to take it from Rutgers or from Yale, as, assuming? that the price is the same. They're going to take it from Yale, of course, you're a distance anyway. I know you're hesitant to say, no, I'm not going to take it from Rutgers, but you're not going to take it from Rutgers. I can see that. Absolutely. 
still hold with them. Does anyone else call you Philip? <laughs> yeah, we call him. We call him. Because I have June Day here, and I discovered she's Cindy, but no one calls her Cindy. <laughs> Professor Cindy now in Chengdu, but no one called her Cindy. Okay, but you see her email is June Cindy Day, or Day for Cindy June Day. So you have to be careful. But she'll be adding people up. <laughs> But June is very easy, like June, July, August, but it's easy. <coughs> so, and uh, it's distance, it's distance that we're going to make it in. And the interesting thing about this, for example, this class is being taped and it's being broadcast to AIS professors around the country. I don't know how many are watching, but there are a few registered. Yeah, I think eight or 10. Okay, and we are, uh, basically, this is the mode of the future. And this is what we call synchronous education, where people watch it while it's happening. But the benefit for synchronous is only if they could ask a question or they might ask a question. Uh, this is also being recorded, and people can look at it, and you can look at it again. Okay, and if it's audit seminar, you might not. But if it is intermediate accounting and you are confused about what happened in class, you will. And so the mode of education is changing very dramatically. And progressively there will be environments in your home that you sit down and it's like virtual Philip sitting here. <laughs> okay? It's like virtual reality, integrated environment. We try this with a little camera in the middle that looks left to right and etc. And you see the virtual Philip ask a question and it's like asking it in class. And it's just kind of getting the technology right and etc. It's going to happen. Okay, and the next thing is do you want to drive? I drive an hour each way to get here. Or you want to do it from your pod at home. And doctor seminars probably many of you would come. But in the graduate class with 300 people in the world, do you get to ask a question? You like, you get to look at the girls that they size. <laughs> in the virtual reality, you might even look at the girls from, from home. So he doesn't want to look at the girls. So that's it. Uh, but uh, that's going to change. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to consider is should you take your education at Rutgers or you are just getting an education wherever you can get? That was a discussion yesterday. Okay, take AIS from Miklos at Rutgers, takes auditing from Arnie Wright at BC or from Ted Mock at USC, uh, take, can't do it anymore, but take Bill Beaver in efficient markets in Stanford. Would you? Or you rather take it to your local professor? I think you would rather have Bill Beaver. Don't say it because a local professor might not be too happy. But isn't that, that the, the trend? Next thing, this is even more shocking to you guys. Next thing is, um, who is going to be the instructor? Is it going to be someone that knows the subject matter? Or is it going to be Tom Cruise, who is very charming, gorgeous, the girls will go truly, okay? Uh, and is a great deliverer. Who you want to take? The knowledgeable one? You have a class of 200 people. You never talk to Tom Cruise. You never talk to the instructor anyway. So we better have Tom Cruise that at least more entertaining and delivers a better story. Now that's bad competition for you guys in, in your colleges. Okay, I just wanted to do this introduction for us to understand this uh, talk about the environment. The other thing I I plan to do is uh, I apologize to you, and I will need to apologize to you, 
Um, I picked up a couple, couple of slides out of introductory auditing textbook. Okay? And I want to go over them with you to give you a little bit of a background what auditing is. Okay? And you'll learn more and you can get yourself an undergraduate audit test and have a look at it. Although some people think you need to know auditing to do audit research, that's a question of opinion. Sometimes it's better not even knowing too much auditing because you are open. I always say I like young PhD students because they don't know what they cannot do. And so they don't follow that usual track. You know, June, okay, I have to say this. June's idea that auditing is is what auditing, I say that auditing is in the future. She doesn't care, okay? Because of that, she created all these interesting things. Audit 4.0, we just got a blockchain paper published now, etc. because she just kind of goes to the future, okay? And actually, she's not having a lot of audit. She has AIS, AF, she has MIS background. Uh, was very good for her. Oh, in the four years, five years, she's done here, six years, she's done here. Um, she learned a lot. And uh, she knows a lot of what it is these days. But uh, it's her view of how, what the world is. Denise, on the other hand, uh, she was a businesswoman for a while. So she has a business background. And then she came here and took her professional accounting and yay. So she has a lot of accounting academic background. Um, and then she went to the PhD program and uh, the machine gun of, actually June has seven publications too. So don't, uh, uh, don't uh, understand. So let me try to connect my cell phone, my laptop here, and I want to show you these slides. I'm going to give you one little break in the middle, and then Andrea is going to talk to you a little bit blockchain, and I'm going to come back and talk about audit research. Okay, so that's kind of the plan here. There are four stages of an audit, and the first stage is audit planning, the second stage is control testing, and test of transactions. And then the third stage is analytical procedures and test of detail balances. And the fourth one is completing the audit. Okay? Now, you can think of auditing as a research project whereby you formulate some hypothesis at the beginning and then you test this hypothesis in different ways. And then this idea of controls, what is a business control or a process control? What is that? You took auditing, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. you took auditing yeah. undergraduate, didn't you? Yeah. So what is a control? Control. There's a type of control for it. Huh? There's a type of controls. But what is a control? There are many types of controls, but what is a control? Say in English, not in auditing standards. Just say what is the purpose of a control. To advise, to have to be in charge. To, to make sure that he yeah. does the right thing, correct? Yes. Yeah. So controls are verifications of good procedure. Okay, and why there is an emphasis in controls and audit? Because it's very difficult to examine, used to be very difficult to examine every action of business, every transaction. So what you do, you create a method to verify that things are being done right. 
And uh, now the auditor looks at the method to verify if things are being done right, are being followed. And then you can reasonably think that things are being done right. Because it used to be very difficult to examine everything. Now, what has changed over there? That's right. Information systems were created, and a thing called full population testing have evolved. Means in old days, the typical way to examine a population is you picked up a sample, a piece of it, had a look at it, <coughs> and if that was okay, you assumed that the rest of the population okay, and if you had taken a sample of 10%, just <coughs> simplify what, you multiply by 10 and say this is the value of the population. Yes? So the, uh, we have the ability to get you still can get. The question is, what do you do with it? Okay, I thought that you can, meaning, uh, I will go this a little bit later, but there is no reason for me not to advance it a little bit. Um, you are going to learn in your methodology courses the way to think about the world is the following. You read the literature, extract the key things in the literature, create a theory, formulate some hypothesis, we are going to do something, uh, something empirical. So think about the world, see what other people have done, based on those assumptions, get your vision of the world, and create your theories that you're going to test. Correct? Isn't that what you're going to learn in your methodology? But is that what's happening in research today? That's not pure method. That's not what you learn on your methodology, correct? Class. Actually, uh, I mentioned Bill Beaver here. Oh, maybe 25 years ago, I consulted for the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, and we created the Inflation Accounting Database, FASB 33, and the Pension Accounting Database, FASB 36, 37. Okay, this was the first time, and probably since then, the only time that the FASB got data to help researchers and to help themselves. And I was doing the project from Columbia, and Professor Sandy Burton, who became dean at Columbia and was <coughs> chief accountant at SEC for a while, was my partner, and Bill Beaver was the other consultant, the three of us. Okay. And so Bill wanted to use the FASB 33 database on inflation accounting. And he got one of his PhD students, Professor Mark Landsman, at that time Mark Landsman, one of his, to analyze the data. And they ran thousands of regressions on top of the thing and keep changing their hypothesis. Okay, and I looked at that and I said, eh, that's not what I learned and accepted. Uh, but I think that's what research is today. Is, uh, we had a PhD student, Chi Lu. Uh, she's now a professor at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, very, she's very good. And I remember that in my Bell Labs day, um, John, there was a guy there called John Tukey. And John Tukey was a professor at Princeton and the uh, statistical fellow at Bell Labs. And you, you must have said, heard about the Tukey test. And it's a very famous statistician. Um, and John Tukey 
brought his PhD student, you should say thank you, I don't make you do this, to graph functions. So they will get hundreds of dots and then goes. And he developed this whole thing uh, he called exploratory data analysis. Okay, EDA. You think you could go and steal, steal a marker from Barbara if you, I forgot to, I forgot to ask for that. Uh, exploratory data analysis. And EDA, or confirmatory data analysis, CDA. And what we used to do is do spike uh, uh, graphs and do all these graphs and analyze the data looking at the graphs. Um, very interesting kind of research. And what you start to see now is people doing a lot of data exploration maybe with regressions, maybe with descriptive statistics, and a lot with visualization. And then based on the exploration with the data, they come up with those hypotheses that you came out only from the theory. And if you talk with some purists, they say that's absolutely cheating and you cannot do this, that's again scientific method, and it's dishonest, and etc. What do you think? physics, and not theories of physics, that even today haven't been totally confirmed. So now, theory, uh, you know, uh, theories don't come necessarily from it. Maybe from some known facts and some extrapolation. But uh, I think what you're expressing is the orthodox view. Yeah, yeah, when I was, no, no, I think it's very interesting, the, the dichotomy, I'm not criticizing what you're saying. Actually, I said, I had this discussion with Professor Kogan, who is stubborn and very concerned. Uh, and I was, uh, this was actually one of the AI seminars, and uh, actually in the survey courts. And to my surprise, he actually agreed more with Abby's view and my view, okay, um, is that now you have different tool set and different abilities. So you do things differently. And I was very surprised at thank you very much. I'm very surprised that uh, Alex agreed. Okay, but I don't want to talk a little bit more about this. So But I think the modern trend 
And even if you don't say you are doing this, you actually do it. And if you don't say you are doing it, you are cheating because you're not doing what you said, what you did. Okay? Yeah, you should say, I explore the data, these look promising, but what the big thing to be careful is what we call overfitting, whereby you create a model with one data and then you test the same data. You cannot do that because that way you're not proving anything. You're just proving that you extracted the model correctly. Nothing. So there are a lot of, there is a thing called jackknife. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Uh, a jackknife is, you have a population. You take one variable off, use this whole population to predict that variable. Then you put that back in, get the next one, take it off, use this whole population without that variable. That without that value to test it and go million times this, this effort. It's called jackknife. Okay? Or you do the more traditional thing, segment your population, part of it used for predicting, part of it you use for testing. Hold on samples. Okay? So that's that is a way, this is a way to avoid overfitting in an EDA environment. But the big difference now that Tuki didn't have is that you have Tableau, Spotfire, these fantastic visualization software that you don't need to manually run regression, you look at the data. Okay, so this is kind of a change on the world. And I have been arguing that we should use EDA in the audit process. Now what, what is this? <coughs> <coughs> audit process like? I just want to see what my next slide says. Okay, it's just bigger, so I can show. So the first part is, let me just read you the pieces. Accept client to perform the initial plan. So this is Aaron's book classic use the book, not the top seller now, but was it for what? Um, first, this is already a little bit wrong. Why? Because before you accept the client, you examine the client very carefully. Why? Because you, if a client is risky, you will be sued. And if you be sued, you lose a lot of money. So you don't take a client unless the client is reasonably reliable. Is that good or that's bad? Ed, what do you think? Um, for business, uh, making money is bad, but you know, take a risk. But for their, uh, I would say uh, for the, uh, the accounting firm, it's better to exam and make sure that they have a, a perfect Actually, client. I think the opposite. I think for making money is good. You like, decrease your risk. Yeah, for making money, I said it's bad. Making business, it's bad. But for, you know, for the risk of you know losing the business, it's better for you because we know like yeah. Iran. Because the loss function of the auditor is very asymmetric. Exactly. Okay, you make a little bit of money in each engagement, but you have a loss. You lose a lot of money, even if you win the loss. So the loss function is very high. Uh -huh. Now that's the point. Now. What do you think of what we just discussed for society? Is it good for society that you reject risky clients? What do you think, Zoom? Uh, it's not good for society. Why? Uh, because that bad clients will not be audited well. Absolutely. The big four firms supposedly has better audit quality, correct? Society benefits when a good auditor examines a client and makes him better. Okay, so for the society ten point, the guys who really need the audits are the bad guys, not the good guys. You don't expect IBM and uh, uh, and uh, G or whatever to have major frauds. In Do you? It's the little guys, and sometimes it's not frauds. Most likely, it's just bad accounting, bad management, uh, etc. 
And actually those guys, the high risk guys, get the less reputable audits. Because the most reputable audits are expensive and they don't want to take the risky clients. There are periods that entire industries are not taken as new clients. Auditors don't have a lot of state taste for startups that are going public. They choose. But for society, that's not. For society, you would like every shaky but promising business to get a good auditor looking at. Do you agree with me? You can disagree. I hate when people agree with me all the time. That's why I like Professor Alice in the audience. He never agrees with me. Unless he's sleeping. Efficiency of society. Yeah, I mean, you you said those those small those bad those bad companies are small, so they have little impact to the society they bring up. But for those big companies like GE or like those the Wells Fargo, those companies, they if they break up, the whole society will break up, like the 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 error. So that's for the big the companies, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for big companies, actually big companies don't need to be audited. Not They're big really. in audit departments, etc., etc., maybe not, but uh, etc. But society benefits if you get a shaky company with reasonably weak management, but good social mission, been doing something useful, uh, to become better. So uh, we have this argument, it's a, it's a valid argument all the way around. Uh, but but this game is not set that way. The game is set for profitability. And uh, well, we'll, we'll talk more about this. Uh, OK, now the, the next set of things. Understand the client risk. <coughs> <coughs> Assess business risk. Do some an analysis. This preliminary analytic procedures is a way to figure out where the risks are. Uh, and then let's talk about materiality. Does everyone here know what materiality is? Materiality is allowable error. You can't measure things exactly. So what do you do? You measure approximately. And the materiality threshold is how much error is permissible. Okay, when you read the financial <coughs> audit opinion, it says, uh, we blah, 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 blah. attest that financial statements of SYZ company fairly represent, fairly meaning, they don't say exactly represent. Why? Because they take examples, not the whole test. It's impossible to make exact measures. If I ask you how long the stable is, you're going to say is, uh, let's use meters, that is better. This is 14 meters and 31 centimeters. That's an added measuring better. So it says 31 centimeters uh, dot 55. And then I say, you measure it better. Then you get the microscope or whatever and get two more digits. So you always can improve your measure. Okay, and the question is how exact things can be that you tell the stockholders this is okay. That's materiality. So it's coefficient of error. Has been discussed forever, and there is no quantitative guidance of what's material. However, typically <laughs> people use 5% of net income, okay? But that's very tricky, because if net income is very small, 5% is nothing. So a company that's barely breaking even. Yeah. And so <coughs> it's a bad criteria, but that's all what we have. Okay, but this is what I wanted for you to understand. So, um, 
materiality is relative, acceptable, <coughs> and audit risk is the risk that you don't detect material error. Okay, the risk that you are taking that there was a material error there and you didn't take it. So you have a population of million items. You picked up a judgmental sample of 40 and you didn't detect an error. That's what your risk is, not detecting the error. So this whole stage of thing is about choosing where you're going to audit in the firm. So it's called the audit planning st stage. And then you have, you know, 20 people to do the audit and so many thousands of hours. What are you going to do with those hours? And how do you decide that? Based on the risk that you perceive in the pieces of the engagement. And research in auditing from the early years has been directed at creating a more quantitative way of assessing risk and detecting risk. Okay? And it continue being that way, except that with full population testing and I think EDA, CDA, this is going to turn it on its head. Um, here at the Cala, we have been working now this year for entire year with the PCOB. PCOB is the public company audit oversight board, and they set audit standards and enforce audit standards in the United States. And what we are trying to tell them is that we need to change audit methodology. And they done okay. We had eight meetings with them. I just got a call from them, and uh, they have. Uh, a, a, a conference in April, and we are talking at the conference in a panel, most likely. Uh, and the Professor Helen Brown is going to be on the DAC assessment committee. So we're getting there, trying to convince them a little bit, but that is still process. So this is the third stage. Here you plan what you do. Okay, here you perform test of controls and substance test, test of transactions. So you check if a control is being performed. Now, if your test of controls are perfect, in theory, you could not do any test of transaction. Because the controls are so good, transactions are going to be right. The other side is, if your controls are total junk, does it mean that your data is bad? Not necessary. I, when I was about your age, I was at UCLA doing my PhD, and we worked with a small minority-owned uh, firm in Watts. Was kind of a not-for-profit uh, help work, and etc. And when we looked at the results one year, they went very well. They had absolutely no controls. They sold African garments, dashikis, and whatever. The reports were very good. The following year, say, oh, you got to do this for us last year. Can you do it this year? We had a look, and it was a total catastrophe. Turns out that the old lady that used to run accounting got sick and didn't work. And so everything was wrong after. So there was no formal control, but there was a person there that was actually a control, but not the kind of control you're used to. Um, and so this is kind of the control testing part of this. And, and the substantive test. And then you perform other analytical tests and extrapolate to your balances and see if they are okay. And finally, you put your results together. I see it's 11.15, so I'm going to give you a five minutes break, and then Andrea will talk about blockchain, and then I'll come back. Okay? Uh, 
I'll give you, send you the slides. And I'm going to, if Andrea will remind me, send you this article about new forms of thinking about hypothesis testing, etc. Basically what I was talking to you. They call it the depth of theory. And when you take your methodology courses, you are going to make your professor very nervous <laughs> with that. Okay. Uh, but that's the way the world is evolving. So five minutes break, so you can go to. Andrea Rosario. For those <coughs> that don't know, I have a third year PhD student in the Accounting and Information Systems Department. My advisor is Professor Rico Spasarelli. I worked with him for quite some time because before coming back to Rutgers to pursue my PhD, I used to be his undergraduate research assistant back in 2009 to 2011. So She's old, huh? We forgot how old she is. She's <laughs> very old. <laughs> uh, so I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with Professor Rossarelli. And uh, you'll see from the audit class like how many different things you're going to learn and the out of the box thinking that you're going to be exposed to. So today I'm going to talk about blockchain for accounting and insurance. This is a topic that I'm really interested in. The first time that I learned about blockchain was in my uh, electronic commerce class with Professor Kogan. I started realizing that this technology, as revolutional as it is, I started seeing that this is uh, going to have some impact, or perhaps a major impact, on the accounting and insurance professions. So who here has heard about blockchain? Everyone.
payment system. But as many of you are probably aware, there is different applications of blockchain, right? Because some applications of blockchain can be used to track financial assets or uh, track the provenance of diamonds. So Satoshi Nakamoto invented the Bitcoin blockchain so that users can transact directly with each other anywhere in the world for little to no transaction cost. Now this is an important concept because this is the main reason as to why the blockchain is so popular at this point in time because it is the first time, it represents the first time that users can transact directly with each other without the need for a central authority. blockchain transactions are combined into blocks, the miner combines these transactions into a block, and then they solve a complex mathematical puzzle, which is a hashing function. The hashing function can consist of numbers of letters, but it, it looks like everything is so random. Right? So that's the hashing function. And it is used as a form of encryption and also as a form to store. Each block is also timestamped and chained to the previous blocks, thus forming a linear chain of blocks. This concept of a, a linear chain of blocks is important because every subsequent block that gets added to the blockchain has some information from the previous blocks. So what this means is that if I want to change a transaction that has already been blockchain. I would have to change the previous transaction and then that means that I essentially have to change all the transactions, theoretically all the transactions that have been already posted to the blockchain because they're all linked to one another. So what are the key characteristics of the blockchain? Well this is a distributed and decentralized ledger. This means that there is no central authority central authority or, or a, a centralized ledger, we can think of um, an example of that as an ERP. So a lot of us are probably familiar with ERPs, right? So if company A has an ERP, company B is going to have a different ERP. So they may not have the same view of economic events. But on the blockchain, we have a decentralized and distributed ledger which means that both company A and company B have the same views of economic events. Or it doesn't have to be an economic event because there's blockchains for practically anything that you wish to have a blockchain for. But for the purposes of accounting and insurance, it would have to be an economic event. Another characteristic of the blockchain is that it is tamper resistant. Because of the validation protocol that it uses, that it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to change previous transactions, the blockchain provides a robust audit trail, which is very attractive to auditors and to big four accounting firms. And then finally, we have accountability on the blockchain because the blockchain uses a digital signature, right? So the digital signature can be used to link Abby to a payment transaction that she has posted to the blockchain because Abby needs to have a digital address. Now, there's many different types of blockchain. I only uh, <coughs> list two here because I think these are the the primary types of blockchains, but there's there's a, also a hybrid blockchain. It's like half private, half public. I'm not entirely sure how that blockchain would work, but just to show you that there's many different types. For uh, public and permissionless, this is uh, how the blockchain essentially started. We can think of the Bitcoin blockchain as being public and permissionless because anybody can join the Bitcoin. All you have to do is download the software, create a digital wallet, save your private key, 
and then you can send transactions, receive transactions, or you can become a miner if you have enough computational power. Another different type of blockchain is the private and permission blockchain. For some reason, this type of blockchain is becoming very popular among the, the different blockchain alliances that we're seeing to date. And I find this kind of surprising because as Professor Miklos and I have talked about before, uh, the whole purpose of the blockchain is so that this is visible by as many participants as possible so that we can mitigate any errors or any uh, rogue actors that may want to do some illicit actions, correct? Yes. But this is a this is where the industry industry is at this point. So in the private and permission blockchain, access to participants is limited. So if I want to set up my own blockchain to to track research papers, I can have <coughs> I can design the blockchain and have it so that Arian, Abby, and Phil join my blockchain, but then nobody else joins it because I give them permission. And he and Nuri <laughs> and everybody else. <laughs> but that's it, nobody outside of this class. But then at the same time, I can give Abby the permission to be the miner on the blockchain, but she cannot send or receive transactions. Whereas Arion can send or receive transactions, but he can, he does not have any mining uh, roles for this blockchain.
of these events get reported once to the blockchain. So because these four parties have access to the same blockchain, they can see all five different transactions and they all see the same version of the truth. They see how these five different transactions get this means that if we have a rogue actor or if there is an error in one of these transactions, that we can post an additional transaction proactively, right? Because we cannot go back and change transactions on the blockchain. It's very difficult to do that. And if we do post a change, that not only customer two is going to see the change, but customer one then one and then two are also going to see this change. So this is why the blockchain can help reduce the risk of fraud because we have more than uh, the two eye principle that we talk about in audit. We have many eyes that are watching. Okay, so we start to talk about accounting and insurance. But I'll send you the video that I, I wanted to show here, but essentially what this video is showing is how blockchain can revolutionize the financial services industry, but not just the financial services industry, but also how uh, property titles get recorded, right? Especially in developing countries where the, I guess the checks and balances are, are not as good as in this country or other countries kind of low in the development chain, like they have Poland and maybe Uzbekistan, uh, and basically they think that putting data on a blockchain might be a way to jump development stages and facilitate government openness, and so we are going to have a workshop with them in some exotic place like Kyrgyzstan, actually most likely it would be in Vienna, Austria, but <laughs> <coughs> about how they can use blockchain for this purpose. Andreas will be traveling a lot. <laughs> that could be a, a dissertation chapter. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not for you, it's too it's soon for, for one of them. Right, yeah. So my slide, the right slide is not showing. I don't know why. Actually, this is very good, Amelia. Talk about this. this no, but I had a, a, a slide before that. Okay. I don't know why it's not showing. Can we still watch that video? Because I think, although the sound comes from that computer, we can still hear it because this is a small computer. Wait, are you, you're saying that you're listening, that you're hearing it right now, or that you want to hear it? Uh, let's see. I can send it to you. Yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Sure. Okay, 
different networks like Ethereum, it could be three minutes or less. So it is a, uh, it provides for continuous and close to real time reporting, right? So it not only increases transparency because we have many different participants that are seeing the same version for the truth, but because transactions get posted on a timely manner, we have, we get reliable information for interested parties to make decisions. And then here I have some initiatives of the big four with uh, their experiments with blockchain. PwC has uh, looked at blockchain for the insurance industry. I also read something this morning that PwC formed an alliance with uh, Libra, actually. I'm guessing because of uh, Michael Smith. So they want to, they're looking into how um, PwC auditors can conduct blockchain IT audits. And I think they're also in the FinTech space with blockchain. KPMG is also looking at the impact of blockchain on the insurance industry. But I think this is more from the advisory side at this point, not necessarily the audited side. EOI, EOI, uh, I think they're, they're in the early stages of experimenting with blockchain. Uh, right now, they're seeing what they can do with the blockchain uh, and how it's going to impact the assurance industry. The Lloyd's was ahead of the curve and I think they're still ahead of the curve because they have, uh, it's part of the advisory services practice, but I think they also provide insurance services. It's called a Rubik's platform, which is a private information blockchain. And they were actually successful in conducting a blockchain audit that met the requirements of auditing standards. So I think that's pretty interesting. by Nick Sabo, is Hungarian, Sabo, and uh, Nick Sabo on the internet. And you just go Nick Sabo, and there is a whole discussion of smart contract on YouTube. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting. But look at when he wrote this, in 94, there were no, in, no, no smart contracts, no, no blockchain. They, he didn't imagine this as being uh, blockchain based. Right. I follow him on Twitter. Oh, you do? <laughs> Where is he a professor? Professor somewhere in computer science. Yeah, right? he's in computer science. His, you know, his name is Miklos. Nick, is a name is Miklos, that's Nicholas. Nicholas is Nick. He's Hungarian, like me. Kind 
that the inspector is going to check, the regulator is going to check, and that the audit firm has to execute in order to provide these basically a momentum thing. Um, and uh, now we're using triple entry accounting for, yeah, for this. Not. It's not the same thing. Right, right. So triple entry accounting means
if we can set up smart internal controls to monitor the terms of the contract, we can see how this way you can
framework that's supposed to be very robust? That's a question that we have to consider. And then cybersecurity is also a big issue. Because although the, the blockchain is robust, it's very difficult to tamper with. Digital wallets have been stolen, and also private keys have been stolen. And then we talk about the benefits of the blockchain throughout the presentation, that uh, blockchain provides a robust audit trail. People can see the same view of the transaction, economic events. And then we also introduce the, the concept of smart audit procedures, which can help the auditor perform better audits and thus increase the quality of the audit. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to discuss a little bit, but I have news for you. I looked up, I wanted to see what Nick Sabo University was. I didn't find Nick Sabo University. He got a degree from Washington University. He's a computer scientist. I need to do more research. But I found something very interesting. They are have a big discussion if Nick Sabo is Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah. Did you read I, this? I read that, yeah. Yeah, who is, who is Nick Satoshi Nakamoto? Remember? Yeah, the Bitcoin creator. The guy who started Bitcoin. And people claim that the value of his holding now is $18 million. He's denying it. Of course he's denying it. <laughs> he has denied it all along. Now I don't think he has the Satoshi Nakamoto. It's probably a goof. And uh, I don't know if their holdings is $18 million. They might have sold it already. I don't want to know. Well, I don't know. But is, I thought, I never said, you saw that, huh? yeah, I didn't I see that, I, I thought that was quite interesting. I just want to recap what Andrea said here and have a couple of items of discussion. Andrea is very erudite, I'm going to be much simpler than this. What is, what is a blockchain? Every 10 minutes you collect a block, and what is the block? Is transaction, 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 okay? Then the 10 minutes pass, you use a mathematical algorithm to create a hash. A hash is a one-way algorithm that doesn't allow you to come back to the original, but it always, if you replicate the algorithm, uh, you get the same hash. And according to Alex, our local mathematician, it's highly secure. This is not something that you can tackle. Then you create the next block. Use this thing, the hash, and build on the transactions and create the next hash. Okay, so that is integrity here. You can't change here because this hash wouldn't work. And in order to verify that no one has changed, other people have copies. And they are being paid, in the case of Bitcoin, to create the copy. So if anyone tempered here, this hash wouldn't match this hash because the transaction already had been captured and recorded. So, according to Professor Kogan, the thing, this is first old algorithms, according to Professor Kogan. Professor Kogan is a scientist in two areas, basically mathematics, theoretical computer science, and works with me in continuous audit, and has done that for more than 30 years, or 20 something years. So, Professor Kogan <coughs> seems to know these things. And he said the mathematics are not questionable. He thinks that very, very difficult. And the second thing is that the replication makes sure that someone didn't recreate the hash. Because another person would have a copy here, another 
up here. And every time you build a hash, you do a horizontal verification. Is this clear? Okay, now what is a squad contract <coughs> in this context? Is another thing that you have built in here as like a block, I just make it this up. <coughs> so <coughs> the same integrity across works because you had a copy here, copy here, they couldn't just go and change the contact here. If they need to change the contact, they're going to have to come here in the new volume and announce to the other one so it's not going to work. Now, there has been a pile of breaches into, into Bitcoin, correct? And you hear $50 million here, $30 million there. The breaches have not been in the algorithm. The breaches have been in feeding the data to the algorithm, or the contracts had bad code. They had code that was potential for cybersecurity violations. Okay, there has been no known breaches into the basic blockchain algorithm. Now, we had uh, you guys, we're already here in November, correct? And we had people talking about blockchain in the conference all the, along. And you heard the Rod Brennan, that was from Philips, uh, from Siemens, and now it's at uh, uh, Libra, uh, talking about it. And what we worked with Rod, wrote this paper that we call, that came to be CCM, Continuous Control Monitoring. And when we organize continuous auditing, it's continuous data audit, continuous control monitoring, and continuous risk monitoring and assessment. This is the continuous audit domain. Is data monitoring, control monitoring, and risk monitoring. And assurance and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. When when we did this in the project in Siemens. Uh, Siemens had these things called um, audit action sheets, AAS. And that was basically a long list of steps a computer auditor needs to take in order to audit the ERP, uh, SAP, Oracle, etc. And what the Siemens did, instead of hiring auditors to audit SAP, Siemens is the largest client in the world of SAP. Two German companies, there are 250 instances or more now, now of SAP at Siemens. So they figured out it's e easier to hire, to hire a COBOL expert or a, a computer expert to audit than teach auditors to audit computer systems. So what they did is they created a very, uh, a very long list of things computer auditor needs to do in an audit program. Okay, that's the audit action sheets, and out of the audit action sheet, we created this idea of continuous control monitoring that been published, has been productized by ACL and IDEA. It's a big deal, or at least was a big deal for us. Uh, now, if I recall correctly, uh, the audit program had about 300 audit action sheets, uh, which with about 10 actions per sheet. So it's about 3,000 total audit actions. Uh, great work that they did there, they are very organized. And after we did this work, they read study, they asked us to help them a little bit, and we, I had a PhD student working for a little while, and she, they reduced it to around 187, if I recall the number, audit action sheets. So what Rob did now with blockchain, say, let's look at those audit action sheets and see how do they apply those actions to blockchain. And so he picked up around 80 
actions and plight for plight with blockchain. And it turned out that only about six were applicable. That's what God said, correct? And they are correct me if I recall, I recall this from memory. Uh, so, this thing is quite audit proof. Only six things to be tested. But he also said that he needed to invent other audit actions that are applicable to blockchain. And that's the business model of Libra. That's what Libra is trying to make money on is create an audit program for blockchain. And their idea is an audit station that's one of the elements of the block. Is that correct? So that, that's, that's their idea. Now, remember that this thing is not self-contained. Okay? In order to have integrity, you need to have the copies, many copies, okay? And there are these kind of the proof of work with the concept that is a whole thing. It's just not uh, relevant at this moment. But it's very easy to think about this. In sequence, the thing has integrity. Because you can, if you change anything here, this hash doesn't work. But the only way to know that they haven't been changed is by having comparisons. To see that some of it, you mean here, it's very difficult to go into many, unless you go to the majority of the nodes, and then the nodes are going to disagree. Okay, that's kind of, uh, I always hear the 51% thing, I never pay any attention to that, I think that's silliness. Uh, however, it's very easy to understand. Once you change anything in here, this doesn't work. Okay, and then if you change some more here, this doesn't work. And you are replicating it with data that you already acquired. So, it has a lot of integrity. Computational integrity in sequence. The problem is that these things are not self-contained. How do you get the data here? It comes from somewhere. And that's not a blockchain. Although, now they are talking about subchains, which is a blockchain that feeds the sub the blockchain. And you can have a sub subchain, a sub a chain that's sub 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 chain to sub a blockchain. And people have been imagining this being like the internet with all these branches interlinked, like total spaghetti. Am I confusing you? No, it's, uh, it, they also have this thing they call oracles. And oracles are methods to pick up data from somewhere and put it into the blockchain. And those things, because they don't have the blockchain integrity, are susceptible. So you can have a transaction in here, you have, can have a contract in here, and they have a lot of integrity over time. Because all these copies are there and people are being rewarded for verifying them. And the rewards don't necessarily, uh, in Bitcoin they are monetary rewards. But the reward could be, it's your blockchain like it's her blockchain. So if it doesn't have integrity, you lose and they lose. So you as a user have a motivation to keep integrity. And if there are enough users, you have it. Now, a couple of caveats, and I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just stay in this, and we'll do more auditing next time. Uh, a couple of caveats to, to think about this reasonably well. What I said from the beginning, blockchain is a database methodology, is a method of organizing data and storing data. And the great advantage of, of it is that doesn't rely on one person to trust. It's about trust. Okay, you don't need to go to the bank and bank say, I have honest people and no one is stealing your money. Everyone else is watching it for you. That's the great advantage. It has computational integrity and doesn't rely on a centralized trust authority. So, 
and Ray and me were talking to A. Michael Smith. He is the head of blockchain at PwC. Because the other guy who was the head of blockchain at PwC helped uh, was they funded Libra. And then it seems to me, I don't know exactly the story, he left PwC and went with Libra. Well, I know he left PwC and went with Libra. I don't know how they are funding it or whatever the story is. But it doesn't seem to be a bad relationship because Michael Smith took it over and he's now in PwC partially doing blockchain and he's the guy in charge of continuous auditing. Not in blockchain, separately. And Professor Rosario is writing an article with Michael Smith, correct? Huh? Oh no, Jamie, not Professor, sorry, not Professor Rosario, Professor Freeman. We all know Professor Freeman, correct? You know Jamie? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and so they are writing an article about continuous auditing together. But uh, blockchain is actually Michael Smith's thing there. And he interacts with Libra, she, uh, and I mentioned that in example. Now, a couple of other considerations for you to take. When you see, and we saw maybe three startups here, correct, in blockchain? Yeah, at least. Yeah, and they're all talking about uh, permission databases. Basically meaning instead of having many, many copies, they are talking about having someone in charge of with permission. So you do the <coughs> blockchain internally <coughs> and control access. And I, one of the guys started talking about simplifying the hash algorithm. Because it's, as Andrea said, it's very computational demanding. They are talking about percentage of total users of electricity in the planet going to blockchain. Okay. Even just any little percentage is a lot of, is a lot of energy. Uh, I think that's exaggerated. I, I don't believe that. I never made that computation. But some things that for engineer things are out of whack. You don't, you don't really. But they are talking about the cost of energy being higher than the reward you get to keep track of it and etc. And if the moment you start simplify the hash algorithm, what you are doing is decreasing the reliability. They are now talking about extra powerful new computer that could break the hash in algorithm. I'll see it when it happens. I don't think it will happen very soon. But I, I do believe that, uh, uh, that blockchain is a big thing. And uh, they are trying it to it land records in underdeveloped countries and they are trying it with you know Michael Smith is doing it with NASDAQ okay and uh, transactions so this is uh, uh, and you talk about Goldman Sachs, Citibank, all of them are doing blockchain and I don't know what's going to be the effect on the audit world but there'll be a need to audit blockchain and there might be a tremendous improvement on the efficiencies of audit because you have to audit less things. At the same time, you're going to create all kind of pressures on the feeder mechanism on the interface of blockchain. Blockchain is not self-contained. The data comes from somewhere. And the somewhere typically is going to be an SAP, an ERP algorithm, an ERP location, but could be from open. Do you know that if you get yourself a Bitcoin wallet, put your special code, get the code on it, and then you forget the code, or your computer crashes, you can't recover the data, what happened with your money? Hmm? Goodbye. <laughs> your money is gone. Um, now, I don't know, maybe you know, Andrea, what happens if you make a copy of your wallet? Then you should be able to, but you need your private key. If yeah, you need a private key. key. And then if you print it in the printer, anyone can pick, pick it up. Okay, and it's like my friend who carries a card in his wallet with all his passwords. 
<laughs> Maybe I do the same thing. Do you, how do you keep track of your passwords? I put it in notes in my iPhone. First. You put it in your iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of passwords. <laughs> and how about if you have a 16-bit encoding and you, when you copied it by hand, you, you put one digit wrong? Don't you do that sometimes, a little capture a digit wrong? OK. And what happened with uh, Mr. Nakamoto's $18 billion? That was the weirdest thing. I, I really, you know, I'm not an expert, but I'm more expert than most people. I cannot understand. China was num like 40% of Bitcoin was out of China. Okay, good way to transfer money out of the country legally, good way to conduct a black business in Brazil, full of that, etc. Uh, and then the Chinese authorities forbid. Okay, and the Chinese authorities had a good way to block it. Okay? Went a little bit down and then went up dramatically. Does that make sense? She says it makes sense. Does it make sense? No, it's very weird. I, you know, everything you learn about markets doesn't work, meaning if there is less demand, the value of the product will go down, correct? And as some people are saying, uh, all currencies are going to be electronic in the future. I tend to agree with them. Uh, but are currencies going to be not country denominated? Where there is no country controlling the currency? How are they going to do any market policies? How are they going to control interest rates? I don't know. This is, I, I, you know, I have since I see it blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, for a while. Now, I've been thinking, what is a currency? Meaning that the issues of auditing blockchain, I understand to a certain degree well. I, have, I don't understand what Bitcoin is happening, besides tulips. Remember tulips that I talked earlier? Besides the fact that this is purely Chinese love to gamble, okay? My wife loves to gamble, but she's too cheap, so she doesn't gamble too much. <laughs> My wife's Chinese from Hong Kong, so uh, originally family from Nimbo, so very Chinese, okay? Uh, and I can understand a lot of Americans being very gambling, and I can understand a lot of people uh, trying to place illegal money somewhere, and maybe that's the reason for the the high demand, but I don't under, I totally don't understand, and if I don't understand, I don't invest. Professor Issa invested, just a little bit, but he made a lot of money. You can ask him, I'm sure he'll tell you. Have he told you? He said he put a little bit of money there, hundred dollars or something like that, a little while ago, not too while ago. If you uh, have a little money from, uh, for your scholarship, for living every month, don't put it in Bitcoin. <laughs> but we have, uh, Professor Kogan was here talking about this. We had Alan Jang here, this Chinese guy, uh, was our basically TA for keeping our computers going 25 years ago, just the first guy. And at that time was a big, dot com expansion 2003 and he lost everything he had because he gambled it okay and he's not professor cal state la he's a delightful guy we love him <laughs> but please don't do that i want you guys here a few years from now finishing okay so <coughs> what you need what you need to do is andrea is going to assign papers to be read right andrea and it will be around four per, per week. And you are going to read the four papers. And Andrea will tell you which paper to be ready to present. 
And when you come to present, I know we do Professor Vogel's rental number generator and etc. But I'm going to just say, you present. Or maybe I'm not going to say, <laughs> Andrea will say, who presents? She's keep things organized. Okay? I think electronic copies of the paper are available all the time. We have things in Blackboard, don't we? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> and if downloading Blackboard becomes cumbersome for you, we create a stick for you and give you give you a stick with all the articles. Okay? Uh, it's never bad to send me an email. It's bad not to if you have any concerns. Okay? And when you communicate with me, communicate with someone who has a better memory. Okay, copy it on the air. Unless it's a private thing, and if it's a private thing, of course, I'm very happy to talk. Okay? Good. And remember to, to put your names in front of you so I get to know everyone. I, I will get to know you anyway, but I prefer to know a name. Okay? Thank you. And I'm going to see several of you this afternoon. <coughs> 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 Although I sound terrible, you don't know.